I have the uh, dubious honor or pleasure of introducing the first speaker for this morning. Um, I've done an abbreviated biography uh, of Dave Carmel, uh, only in the interest of time. And these words that describe Dave and his past experiences are in no particular order. Hot tubs, code standards, lawyer money, congressman, and Baghdad. So you kind of put them together any way you want. Of course, if you're from the DC area like we, we do occasionally, that might bring back Tidal Basin and Wilbur Mills, but uh, uh, I don't think Dave was in DC at the time. Uh, Dave is Vice President for Federal and External Re Relations at the International Code Council. And he's responsible for managing ICC's relationship with Congress, federal agencies, and outside organizations. Prior to joining ICC, he was a standards advisor to Iraq, stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad, where he was detailed by NIST, that's the National Institute for Standards and Technology, um, as a standards expert, and was relied on uh, by U.S. Embassy and U.S. military personnel for advice relating to codes and standards and helping the Iraqis establish a codes and standards and conformity assessment system. He previously served five years as Vice President of Public Policy and Government Affairs at the American National Standards Institute, ANSI, in D.C. He was also General Counsel at the National Pool and Spa, Spa and Pool Institute, was responsible for managing the legal aspects associated with the standards development and other things associated with the pool industry. And he was a recognized and still is, I guess, expert on questions relating to liability of standards developers and individuals that are injured by consumer products and, uh, and, and built environment. He's also press secretary at the U.S. Mint, an associate counsel to the U.S. House Judiciary Committee, and he was elected as a member of the Ohio um, House of Representatives, serving two terms representing the district in Toledo. So without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce Dave Carmel, and again, while he's on the way up, and you can kind of reorganize these words, hot tubs, code standards, lawyer money, congressman, and Baghdad. Dave Carmel. I guess, uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, I, I realized this morning uh, why they put me first on the agenda at 8 a.m. Uh, for those of you who attended uh, the code hearings in Minneapolis last year, you recall that uh, the energy code hearing lasted till about 2 in the morning. So I guess the idea was putting me on at 8 a.m., the odds are I'll be finished sometime uh, during the daytime hours, the daylight hours. Okay, for those of you who didn't get the joke, uh, you'll enjoy my presentation because I'm going to go through the uh, ICC code process, talk a little bit about how that works, and get into some of the uh, other uh, services that we provide. The, the vision that ICC has is uh, protecting the health, safety, and welfare of people by creating better buildings and safer communities. And our mission, uh, we do that by providing the highest quality code standards, products, and services for all those concerned with safety and performance of the built environment. We publish 13 codes, which are listed here. I'm not going to go through all those acronyms, but uh, uh, if you would like to uh, uh, see the full list, we have some materials at our uh, table outside the room there. The, the characteristics of the I codes, uh, each one is comprehensive, they're coordinated and compatible with each other, and they're developed according to the same process in the same forum. They, they reference consensus national standards, that's one of the requirements for reference standards in the, in the codes. Uh, each scope has a specific uh, defined scope. They are interdependent and rely on the, uh, on the other codes that uh, are part of the family and there's, they reference each other and provisions are duplicated uh, from one to the other so that there is not uh, conflict between the codes. Uh, and a single interpretation will apply to all of the codes. The, the development process goal is to utilize a process that's open to all parties concerned and to avoid domination by proprietary interests. We call this the ICC governmental consensus process and uh, that's achieved by having the final vote 
rests with those who are uh, charged by law with enforcing or adopting uh, the building codes. So the code committees that hear the, uh, the proposals to change the codes, uh, they are made up of materially affected uh, interests. Not less than 33% of each committee is made up of regulators, uh, those charged with uh, adopting or enforcing the, the codes. And all meetings are in a public forum, and all actions and reasons for action are published. I'll get into a little more detail on that in a moment. The players, of course, uh, code officials, design professionals and consultants, trade associations, builders, contractors, building owners, manufacturers, suppliers, government agencies, and, and basically anyone with an interest. It is a completely open process, transparent. Uh, there is a balance of interest represented, and we follow due process requirements uh, with the right of appeal and uh, consensus reached at the end of the day uh, on, a, on a schedule that's uh, published ahead of time. Coordination is achieved between the various codes through the ICC Code Correlation Committee, and we attempt to eliminate duplication between the codes, and this is managed by having one code committee uh, deal with each issue. And the example given here is uh, with regard to sprinklers, which are covered both in the fire code and the building code. And where you see this section 903 in the building code, there will be an F in front of that section number. That indicates that the fire code committee is the committee that maintains that particular section. Uh, this is the basic cycle of our uh, code development process. I think you have a copy of this on your, on your desk. And uh, uh, very, a very simple process and a process that is uh, set out ahead of time so everyone knows when these hearings will, will occur, what, uh, when the changes will be published, when the comment uh, periods will begin and end, and finally when the final action hearing will occur and when the next edition will be published. And we do publish each of our codes on a three-year cycle. Uh, the, the, current versions of all of our codes are the 2009 I codes. Uh, all the procedures are published. There is a, a web link. I'm hoping that uh, this uh, PowerPoint will be available to you afterwards. I'm getting nods over here that it is. That's good because later on there's some slides here that I'm pretty sure you won't be able to read. So uh, if you want the details, uh, it'll be available to you after the, uh, after the session. So the, the steps in a typical code change cycle, uh, we, we announced that code changes are due. Uh, this year they were due on June 1st. Uh, again, anyone can submit a code change. There's no cost to do so. There's no requirement for membership. Any person who has an interest may submit a code change. The staff reviews those changes for form and format, and they put it into a legislative format, uh, uh, and, and the proposals must be based on the current text. So you have to reference what is currently in the code and suggest a change to that or an addition or a deletion based on the current code. That's published uh, currently on the website approximately 90 days prior to the code hearing. Uh, it's also published in paper form, but those paper forms are only sent out upon request now uh, in order to save uh, the expense of publishing all of those code changes, which are a substantial uh, number of, of changes each session. You, you can download the public proposal form uh, from our website. Obviously everything, actually all these forms, all the uh, information about the process is available on the website. And uh, uh, so the, the format here, underline proposed new text, uh, strikeouts to be deleted, the reason, and importantly, the reason for the change. We have 13 code committees, one for each code, except there are some subcommittees for some, some of the uh, codes. And uh, the fire com code and the uh, wildland urban interface code are combined, as well as the plumbing and the private sewage disposal code and the, uh, the zoning code and the, what's IPMC, I can't remember, anyway. Property maintenance, Property maintenance. very good, thank you. I knew somebody would know. 
So committee action at the first co-development hearing, there are three options for the committee. They can approve as submitted, approve as modified at the hearing, or disapprove. Once the committee takes an action, that is thrown to the assembly, which is everyone in the room. And again, these hearings are open to the public. Anyone can attend. There's no fee to attend. Uh, believe me, we don't make any money from the code hearings. Uh, I, I sometimes say that uh, we're a nonprofit organization, and at ICC, we really take that seriously. Uh, the, the report of hearings uh, after the, the first uh, committee hearing, uh, the report of the hearing is published. The reason for the committee action is part of that report. Uh, the assembly action, if there was one, is also reported. And that's published on the website. And again, if uh, on request, it'll be sent to you in, in uh, the written form. Public comments are then solicited, and again, those are, anyone can submit a public comment. Uh, those will be published. Uh, there's a form on the uh, website to submit your comments. And you may propose revisions or modifications to the code change, and that, that will be published in the final action agenda. Uh, the final action agenda, uh, it's the, the original code change, any public comments, and any changes in the uh, code change that were made by the, uh, the committee or by the assembly action, and that's published prior to the final action hearing. And again, the final action hearing, uh, anyone can attend and testify. The, uh, there's a consent agenda for any items that were heard which did not receive a public comment or where there was no assembly action at the first hearing, those are voted on block. And uh, that speeds up things considerably. If there was any comment or if there was an assembly action at the first hearing, then there's individual consideration and pros and cons are taken at that final action hearing. How am I doing here? I'm good. The, the final vote at the final action hearing does rest with the governmental member representatives. And those are people who are charged uh, by their government unit with the adoption or enforcement of building and fire codes. And so that's, that's the finality of the final action hearing. That, that, that once that vote is taken uh, by those government members, uh, that that is the, the change that's approved and published as the next version of the code. So one of the advantages of the uh, ICC system is that uh, now while there is an appeal available from this final action hearing uh, to the board of directors, it's only on a procedural grounds. And so at the end of this final hearing, you know there is going to be a published document uh, for that for that code after, the, after that vote. So it's, there is a finality to it. There's a, uh, an assurance that at a certain time there will be a new code. Now there have been some changes to the ICC code process that have taken place in the last year. That relates a little bit to our, uh, both the financial cost of managing this process and also to comments we've received from members and, and from the public about the process. So, what, uh, what we have done is, uh, in effect, streamline the process. There will only be one code change cycle each three years. Previously, we did one every 18 months, which uh, was becoming uh, burdensome on everyone involved in the process, frankly. So the new process, there will be a code change deadline, which uh, now we're in a transition period now, but in the future, it will be the first working day in January following the uh, publication of the code. So, uh, let me see, I've got the numbers in here. So in 20, uh, for, the, for the next code process after the 2012 cycle, the uh, uh, date of the, for the f filing of uh, code proposals will be January 1st of 2012 because the new codes will be published in uh, 2011. Uh, the, uh, 
the, the length of the hearings will be reduced and they have promised that hearings will be uh, during uh, daylight hours, <laughs> generally. <laughs> Uh, the daily hearing schedule is reduced to what they've said is a manageable number of hours per day, which uh, I'm not sure exactly what that means. Uh, a successful assembly action at the code development hearing will become the final or the initial motion to be considered at the final action hearing. And that is a change from the previous process where the committee's action was the motion that the final action hearing started with. Now if the, if the assembly changes or overturns the committee action at that first development hearing, that will be the starting motion at the final action hearing. The final action hearings are reduced to six days. It will follow the annual conference. Uh, there will be two code groupings so that uh, the, you won't have to sit through the entire uh, process for if you're only interested in the energy code you'll know ahead of time which group that's in uh, and, and the same with the other codes. Uh, this during this cycle all the hearings are going to be held in October there's a, a printed schedule out uh, in, the, in the lobby there. Uh, in the future there will be two different tracks at two different times and that schedule will be obviously published ahead of time. Uh, the um, group A and group B uh, in, the, in the future, the first group uh, A will be the, the building code, the, fire, the, the fuel gas code, the mechanical code, the plumbing code, and the uh, private sewage disposal code. That will have a code development hearing in April, May of 2012 and a final action hearing in 2012. The group B will be heard uh, which is the energy code, the uh, residential code, uh, the fire code, the other codes. The, the deadline will be January of 2013 and those hearings will be held in calendar year 2013. So we'll, we'll split them up so there's a little less at each of the hearings and uh, hopefully that will uh, uh, make for less, uh, less late night hearings. Uh, this is probably one of those slides that you'll have trouble reading from your seat and if you, uh, you want to go over it will be available later. Now, I want to go over some new projects that ICC has just announced. Uh, the International Green Construction Code has been, uh, was just announced this past month uh, uh, with the tagline safe and sustainable by the book. It is a, uh, a traditional code document. It'll apply to traditional commercial and high performance buildings. It'll be consistent and coordinated with our ICC family of codes. Uh, the residential portions of buildings will be, or we expect the committee will uh, follow the ICC 700 standard, the National Green Building Standard, which was uh, released last year. It will provide a new regulatory framework and it is designed to work with uh, not, not conflict with uh, current green building rating systems and standards like LEEDs and uh, green globes. It'll provide criteria to measure compliance and drive green building into everyday practice. Uh, the first meeting of the Sustainable Building Technology Committee is meeting as we speak in Chicago. There will be four subsequent development meetings through January 2010. Uh, there will be an update at the annual business meeting in Baltimore this fall and we expect the first draft to be completed in April 2010 which will be available as a resource for uh, government entities who are looking for a uh, uh, who have a short deadline for adoption of a green code. Uh, there will be a public comment period when the draft is issued and then it will go through the regular code process and it will be published as a 2012 uh, code so that we'll have a 2012 International Green Construction Code. Some of the subject areas that uh, we expect to be included by the committee and I have to say we expect because obviously the the committee has authority over what it decides to include and, and not include uh, but these are some of the areas that we expect the green code will cover uh, and uh, 
It will use the, the model code approach, so it'll be a, an enforceable code document. We expect that the committee will adopt some minimum and maximum levels of performance. Uh, I will say with respect to energy that the, the, I believe uh, they have already decided uh, or that we expect uh, they will decide that the minimum will be the 30 percent uh, over the 2006 IECC. It'll work as an overlay to the ICC family of codes and again it'll be written in a mandatory language for jurisdictions that wish to adopt a green building code. One other program I want to talk about here is our uh, SAVE program which comes from uh, ICC's affiliate ICC uh, ES and the SAVE program is a program to provide independent verification of claims about the sustainable attributes of their products. Uh, a successful evaluation of the, under this program uh, will result in a, in a VAR report and there are currently nine categories of evaluation. And I will, uh, I will read through those. We have guidelines for determination of recycled content, guidelines for determination of bio-based material content, determination of solar reflectance, thermal emittance, and solar reflective index of roof covering materials, determination of regionally extracted, harvested, or manufactured materials or products, determination of uh, volatile organic compounds, VOCs, uh, for adhesives and sealants, uh, determination of VOCs for paints and coatings, and determination of VOCs for floor covering products, and determination of formaldehyde emissions for composite and engineered wood products, and determination of certified wood and certified wood content and products. Uh, these will be uh, ho helpful to manufacturers who are desiring to sell products into the green uh, building market. It's a voluntary program, uh, provide trusted third party verification, and it can be combined with a traditional uh, ES evaluation report, which those are the reports that are issued by the uh, ICC ES that tell the building official that a new product meets the requirements of the building code. So these work in concert with the building code to tell code officials that a new product actually meets the requirement of the code. And I, I do want to uh, say a few words about the other resources that ICC has. A lot of people, when they think of the building codes, they think of the book, obviously. And of course, that is the business we're in. We sell code books. Uh, but beyond the code books, we have a, a complete staff in Chicago that does interpretations for code officials. If there's a question about what a particular section of the code means, the, the code official can call or write or email to the tech staff and get an interpretation. Uh, they, uh, they have staff opinions on uh, various sections. Uh, we also have a plan review department that uh, will review plans uh, on contract for local jurisdictions where that's maybe a little bit beyond their capability. Uh, or where they need extra staffing. Uh, we have a, a government relations field staff that is available to work with you as advocates for code adoptions. Uh, one of them is here today, Craig Stevenson, uh, is our field rep for the Washington, Oregon, uh, Hawaii, Alaska, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, Wyoming. okay. And uh, we have uh, we have basically a field staff that covers the, the entire country. So there is someone from ICC who can work with you if you're working on a code adoption uh, and they coordinate with us in our Washington office. Uh, we, we have training and education programs for code officials and people interested in the codes. Uh, and, and finally, I wanna talk a little bit about where we'll be in uh, 2012 or where we hope to be uh, I guess first of all, we, we, we believe and uh, I think uh, although staff doesn't take any position on uh, changes to the code, I, I think most of us believe that the 2012 IECC will be 30% better than the 2006 IECC 
and it will be widely adopted throughout the U.S. At least the, uh, by that time, the, hopefully the 2009 version will be widely adopted and the 2012 uh, hopefully uh, ready to go. We hope that the stimulus funds will be used to enhance compliance with the IECC through education training and professional certification. The International Green Construction Code will be available and serve to raise the bar and, and provide a, a higher level of compliance for jurisdictions uh, that wish to go that route. And the uh, ICC ES SAVE program will support acceptance of new building technology to achieve compliance with both the IECC and the IGCC. So that is my presentation. Uh, and if you want more information about ICC, uh, it, there's lots of information both on the code process about uh, what states adopt which codes, uh, that sort of thing, and I've uh, provided my email address here as well. So thanks for your attention, and I guess we're all... Not so fast, Dave. Not so fast. Any questions uh -oh. for Dave? The microphone's here. <laughs> uh, quick question on the IGCC. What's the public, what, what do you foresee as the publication schedule for having the, the green code published and ready to the go. The IGCC? The green, uh, the green? Green code, the green construction code. Uh, we expect that'll be published as a 2012 code. So we'll have a draft next year in 2010, then it will go through the regular code process. There'll be a separate hear set of hearings for the green code, uh, and it'll be published a little, probably a little later than the other codes, but it will be published as a 2012 code. So it should be available by, say, January 2012. And a draft will be available next year. Sir. Uh, John Hogan, City of Seattle. I want to talk about the single code change cycle, get your thoughts on that. Um, the process that's set up by now, all the proposals need to be submitted by June 2009 for the 2012 code, which the states will pick up a year later after the DOE determination, so in effect 2013 to 2016. It seems by having such a long time, we're almost guaranteeing that these codes are going to be obsolete by the time they're implemented by states, or certainly for energy where things are changing very quickly. It also seems that this is, um, we're, going to, we're going to see a lot of states making amendments to try and keep up with things that are changing out there. So we're undermining the goal of the ICBO, SBCCI, BOCA merger to have one national code group. All the trainings, the exams, everything are all predicated on having a single national code. There are going to be all these variations. Seems we're headed for a lot of trouble here, a lot of discontinuity. Your thoughts? Well, that's one way to look at it. <laughs> uh, I guess the other way to look at it would be that uh, our codes have always anticipated that jurisdictions will make modifications to the codes, and they do. Uh, jurisdictions routinely make changes. Uh, the bottom line on the, on the length of time, uh, while we have had two cycles during the three-year period in the past, we've generally only published every three years. Now, there was, there was a circumstance in 2004 where a, a version was published in between. That was financed uh, by, by a grant uh, from, from, I believe, from, maybe from the Department of Energy, wasn't it? Or, I don't know, but somebody, we, we can't afford to publish every, every uh, every year and a half, so we, we, we're on a three-year publication cycle. So I, I'm, I'm not sure, uh, uh, you know, it, was it better to have 18-month cycles? I don't know, you can, people can debate that. Uh, basically, it came down to an issue that uh, the cost of doing that every year and a half was, was something that ICC just couldn't uh, keep on uh, doing under the, under the requirements that its board uh, Put on the on the staff, so that was the choice we had to make. I mean, we we've had uh, a very bad year financially, and that that obviously is one of the factors that affected that decision. Our revenues fell dramatically last year, to the point where we laid off about 33 percent of our staff, and everyone else took a 10 or 20 percent pay cut, which we are still operating under. So. It, it, part of the decision was financial, and part of it was to try to streamline the process and, and uh, allow us to do two cycles, uh, you know, on a, uh, what do 
want to say on a, on a uh, shifted cycle so you don't have all the hearings all at once. Mm. So, other questions? Yes, sir. Good morning, Alan Seymour with the Oregon Department of Energy. Yeah. Uh, I guess I have two questions for you. Don't mean to put you on the spot, but I guess the Northwest is hitting you with some questions here. That's why I'm here. <laughs> One is with the big national emphasis on both green buildings and enhanced energy requirements. Do you foresee ICC requiring for plans examiners and inspectors at least IECC certification? or having that requirement in the near future. I mean, if uh, you're looking for federal stimulus money and to have the, the you know, codes enforced if you're not even requiring them to be certified in IECC, do you see that as something coming down the road? Well, I guess the answer would be I don't see ICC requiring our members to be certified. I mean, uh, w you know, we're a, we're a membership association. We we basically respond to what our members uh, want us to do and what programs they want us to pursue and, and the rest. Uh, it's highly unlikely, I think, that they would require that of members of ICC. And now, if a, if a particular jurisdiction wants to require a, a certification in order to be a code official in their jurisdiction and, and mandate uh, some kind of certification, that's certainly uh, something we'd be happy to work with them on, but I don't see, I, I guess the problem is ICC really doesn't have the authority to mandate that its uh, members get certain I, training. I guess that leads to the second part of my question is that, uh, and of course this is just something we do in Oregon, but we don't just have a reference in chapter 13 to the IECC, we actually put the requirements in IECC and it really seems like somewhat of a deterrent when you reference in chapter 13 the IECC you're looking to, at everyone from the design community to the inspector to the plans examiner to actually purchase and look at and use a second code. Have you thought about integrating the IECC into Chapter 13 rather than having it as a separate publication? Then if it's integrated in that document, it could be included as far as inspections, uh, testing, everything else associated with that code. Uh, well, one of the things that I know uh, that the, the board has determined is that there is going to be a, a coordination so that the provisions of the IECC will be conformed to the provisions of uh, Chapter 13 of the IRC. That's what you're referring to, right? Uh, chapter 13 of the IBC. The IBC. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, the, the codes are coordinated, but uh, you know, I, I don't know, that's, I, that question is kind of like why don't we incorporate the plumbing code or the other code. I guess the, uh, you'd, you'd have to go back to the, uh, the reasons that the, the committees are the way the committees are, that they choose people with a certain expertise to sit on those committees. And uh, if you start including, you, you can see how thick the IBC is. Uh, <laughs> And if you, start, if you included all the codes in that, you know, you'd have that problem that it gets too big. So I, I don't know the, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question, but Thank you. uh, keep in mind that we do make all of our revenue by selling code books, so that might be, have something to do with it. Uh, one final question. Yeah. I, yes, I'm Karen Clifton from Alabama. I just wondered if there was any um, plan to go to an electronic voting type process for the final hearings. It seems like sometime like with, in our state, we may have 13 voting members, but we can't afford to send that many and certain special interest groups can populate the hearings and get things passed that the majority of people might not agree with, but they have no opportunity to vote. Is there any plans to go to an the, electronic the, voting process? Yeah, the, the, uh the, the board did request staff to examine uh, electronic voting and uh, they, they have done a pilot to test it. They, at this point, they don't think they have it to the point where it's, it can work. Now, it's, it's still on the, uh, it is still on the planning stages to, to continue to move in that direction to see if there's a way to do it. But the pro there are problems with electronic voting when you have live testimony and uh, the, the, the type of process we have. 
uh, and there's, there's also some issues that come up with determining who's voting and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's not off the table, but it's not going to happen in the next year or so, I don't think. Uh, the other thing you, you, you mentioned is that, you know, the special interests, which I, I do want to address that because I've heard this criticism and I hear it various places uh, that, you know, well, uh, the special interests can come to those hearings and vote, but, you know, public officials can't. Uh, when you're talking about the final action hearing, all of the people voting at that final action hearing are code officials. They're government officials, not a single special interest, not a single manufacturer votes at that final action hearing. So I, I hear that criticism and I want to just make sure everyone understands that that final vote is not, uh, it's, it's, you, you're not talking about uh, people from the manufacturing side or from the uh, supplier side or what have you, you're talking about uh, uh, code officials and elected officials. Thank you very much. Okay, back to you. Thank <laughs> you.